Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this morning's plenary on HCA's cost and uh, classification of spinal cord injury. Um, I am Joy Chowdhury. I'm the clinical lead and consultant at uh, the Spinal Injury Center in Oswestry. My co-moderator is having some technical glitches, Mr. Naveen Kumar, who is a consultant colleague of mine. What we will do is we will go through the individual presentations first, and I would encourage uh, the audience to use the chat function for questions at the end of all the presentations. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Ronald Reeves, and it gives me great pleasure in introducing him. Uh, he's well known in the field of spinal cord injury. He's a spinal cord injury specialist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's also an associate professor of uh, physical medicine and rehab at the Mayo Alex School of Medicine. Apart from his uh, clinical practice, he's keen in education and research and has over 100 odd publications. Um, he also co chaired the development of the Asia East Coast uh, e learning program, a very valuable e learning program called the INSTEP. It is five in the morning uh, where he is. So a very good morning to you, Ron. And here is your presentation. Play, please. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to uh, present at Brit Spine 2021. I'm grateful uh, to the organized committee for the invitation to be here uh, to speak about the international standards for neurologic classification of spinal cord injury. Um, again, uh, my name is Ron Reeves and I'm a spinal cord medicine specialist at uh, Mayo Clinic. First of all, um, I want to uh, note that I have no financial conflicts of interest. Um, I'm speaking to you uh, this morning from the north central portion of the United States, the city of Rochester, Minnesota, which is the um, an original home of Mayo Clinic. Um, we subsequently have uh, locations in the southwestern, southeastern United States, but this was the first uh, clinic location. Um, our uh, primary trauma hospital is St. Mary's Hospital, which is approximately 1,200 beds. And our spinal cord injury unit is on the top floor of this building just across the street from the main hospital. The first written uh, record of traumatic spinal cord injury can be found in the Edwin Smith Papyrus, written uh, approximately uh, 4,500 years ago. Uh, at that point, uh, phys physicians were judged based on the outcome of their patients. And as spinal cord injury was a universally fatal disorder, it was described as an ailment not to be treated. That was largely the state of things until the early 1900s. My talk today will um, comment about early spinal cord injury care development. We'll talk about the development of the spinal cord injury exam, talk about the history of efforts to teach the exam, and then I'll delve into some details regarding the sensory exam, motor exam, and the anal rectal examination, the elements of the exam which feed into the classification system. The first spinal cord injury centers were developed in the mid to late 1930s and 40s. Dr. Donald Monroe formed a unit at Boston City Hospital in 1936, was, which was, as far as um, is known, the first spinal cord, dedicated spinal cord injury center in the world. Dr. Su or Dr. Uh, Ludwig Gutmann uh, formed a unit at Stoke Mandeville Hospital in 1944, and that unit made a number of critical contributions to the history of spinal cord medicine worldwide. But other units were also formed in Toronto, Perth, Western Australia, and uh, across um, the, um, the world. The Stoke Mineral Games were held for the first time in 1948, and this was um, the vision of Dr. Ludwig Gutmann. They actually opened on the same day as the London Olympics in 1948. But the games provided an opportunity to bring together people surviving spinal cord injury, as well as the physicians that cared for them, and provided an opportunity for scientific collaboration and uh, development of the early field of spinal cord medicine. 
over time, the Stoke Mandeville games grew in size and um, participation and ultimately transformed into the World Paralympic Games, which were held for the first time in Seoul, South Korea in 1988. Spinal cord care advancement um, uh, efforts uh, progressed through the 1950s and 60s. In 1966, Dr. Hans Frankel, another physician at Stoke Manorville Hospital, published the first description of the benefits of intermittent catheterization. And he also proposed the first spinal cord classification system. You'll see here the A, B, C, D, E classification system that he described um, is the foundation upon which the Asia impairment scale now sits. Although the definitions are different, some of the fundamental characteristics of the current system we use today can be seen in Dr. Frankel's classification, where an A injury was the most severe injury with no motor or sensory sparing. A B injury had sensory sparing but no motor function. C and D injuries had varying levels of motor preservation. Definition is now different today. And an E injury was someone who had an injury but had recovered to a motor and sensory, normal motor and sensory exam, but they may have hyperreflexia, altered gait, et cetera. In 1971, Dr. John Young received the first funding from the US government to establish a spinal cord injury model system, and that was in Phoenix, Arizona. In the few years following that, a number of other spinal cord injury model systems were funded in the US. Um, and that program continues uh, today and is actually um, the uh, proposal for new spinal cord injury model centers just uh, was released um, uh, yesterday. So in the early 60s and 70s, spinal cord injury professional organization development also took root. The International Medical Society of Paraplegia was founded at Stoke Mandeville Hospital in 1961. The American Spinal Injury Association was founded in 1973 and held its first annual meeting in New York City in 1975. Subsequently, IMSOP uh, changed its name in 2001 to the International Spinal Cord Society, now affectionately referred to as ISCOS. Now the development of the international standard in spinal cord injury began uh, in the late 1970s. Um, the goal of the exam was to allow detailed injury level determination and severity assessment for patients in the supine position with spinal instability. In particular, this was necessary to allow for reliable and consistent research data across sites within the US Spinal Cord Injury Model Systems Project. The first examination um, description and standardization was developed by a committee chaired by Dr. Sam Stover and that was published in 1982 under the title Standards for Neurologic and Functional Classification of Spinal Cord Injury. Those initial standards were subsequently reviewed and revised by committees chaired by Dr. David Apple in 1987, Dr. Bill Donovan in 1990, and Dr. John DeTuno in 1992. The 1992 revision uh, was also reviewed and endorsed by the International Medical Society of Paraplegia thereby becoming the first international standards for neurologic classification of spinal cord injury, something now referred to as the Inski examination. This uh, was the first um, booklet that was published as well. And the pocket books have been revised a number of times, but are still available today from the American Spinal Injury Association. Around that same time in the early 1990s, there was a recognition that without training, clinicians were imprecise and inaccurate in their use of the Asia standards. And hence efforts began to provide improved training and accessibility of the standards to spinal cord clinicians um, worldwide. The American Spinal Injury Association developed a number of training materials that were um, uh, developed in concert with the International Spinal Cord Spinal Cord Society. So for a number of years, videotapes were available, um, and then those transitioned over to uh, DVDs in the early uh, 2000s. Unfortunately, despite the presence of those materials, 
difficulty with using the standards continued to be noted by researchers um, and the benefits of in-person training and discussion uh, were, have been consistently documented as in this paper from uh, MJ Mulcahy and colleagues at the Philadelphia um, Shriners Children's Hospital. In 2005, myself and uh, Bill Waring from the Medical College of Wisconsin began an effort to develop a web course um, that was uh, eventually became known as the International Standards E-Training Program or the INSTEP course. This course is available through the American Spinal Injury Association website at the web address shown. And it was first unveiled at the Asia Annual Meeting in Dallas in 2009. If, you, if one goes to the Asia website, um, in particular to the Learning Center tab at the Asia website, this page will come up, enter uh, by clicking on this site here, and a variety of uh, resources are available regarding the International Standards Exam. The uh, INSTEP uh, course that we developed is available for a modest fee. The uh, fee goes to offset the cost of running the website and updating and revising the course periodically. There's also a webinar available regarding difficult classification cases, um, which one could uh, view if you want follow-up information after our seminar today, and free downloadable resources such as the uh, International Standards Worksheet and the Motor and Sensory Guides, and I'll be showing those in subsequent slides. Over time, as new research becomes available, detailed information becomes available, the standards are periodically updated and revised. And so no matter what we talk about today, in three, five, or 10 years, there will certainly be new versions of the standards, and so it'll be important to uh, seek out that information to remain current. And I'll mention some of the new changes um, in my talk, and we can discuss them in the uh, question and answer session as well. It's consistently been the case, multiple uh, researchers, multiple sites, um, children, adults, that um, formal training uh, in the application of the standards improves their utilization. And that is in particular why um, sessions like this are uh, important for the field of spinal cord medicine. In particular, in Christian Schuld's paper published in 2013, he noted, as has been noted consistently through time, that determination of the motor level um, and the distinction between uh, AASB, C, and, and D injuries are common errors of uh, difficulty. Um, of note, also, they documented that even experts have approximately a 10% error rate when applying the standards. And so this is important to keep in mind even senior faculty members may be uh, making uh, classification errors um, uh, with the standards. This is the most current version of the International Standards Exam score sheet. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a revision date of April 2019, so you can tell if, if the document you're using is up to date or not. In particular, the changes in 2019 are apparent in a circled uh, area here with um, scoring noted with the stars for non-spinal cord conditions for the motor and sensory exam. Um, although this portion of the form didn't change, the utilization of the zone of partial preservation was also revised in 2019. Um, and I'll mention that toward the end of my talk. On the back of the form is detailed information regarding uh, muscle and sensory grading, the age impairment scale, and detailed steps to classification. In general, if you follow the classification steps as outlined, you'll come to the right answer. Problems usually occur when people think they know the steps and they don't actually read and follow the directions as outlined here. Um, in the lower left is uh, key information about non-key muscles um, as well, and I'll mention that um, later in the talk. The sensory examination tests 28 dermatomes on each side of the body, and each dermatome has a key sensory point. A three-point scale is used to assess sensory function. Absent one for impaired, either more or less than uh, normal, and then normal. If a non-spinal cord impairment is present, 
the sensory function is noted with is scored as it is found on exam, but then an asterisk is added to note the non-spinal cord impairment, such as perhaps scarring of the skin, uh, skin graft in a particular location, a peripheral neuropathy that alters sensation. There are two key parts to the sensory examination, um, the sharp and dull discrimination and light touch appreciation. The use of a cotton swab or a safety pin um, is um, used for this examination. It's recommended that uh, relatively uh, new examiners uh, touch their own skin with the cotton swab or the safety pin um, to get a sense for how much force to use um, and, and then apply that to patients, obviously not using the same safety pin as you used on yourself. The examination is performed with the eyes closed or covered. The face is used as a normal reference point and it may be necessary to go back to that periodically so the patient knows what is normal. Um, with the eyes closed, it's important to orient the patient to the part of body being tested so they know roughly what to expect and limit other distractions such as touching other parts of the body, moving for positioning, uh, moving your hands, et cetera, so that the, the patient can focus on the key uh, sensory stimulus being tested. Light touch sensation is performed with a cotton swab. And if the patient can't accurately assess the cotton swab on their face, there's no point in proceeding with the rest of the exam. It's important because their eyes are closed for you to vary the cadence of the touch across the dermatomes so that you can predictably discern are they able to perceive the light touch or not. Obviously, if they don't feel anything, they won't typically respond. So that would be scored as a zero. If the patient is able to feel this touch, but it's different than the face, either more sensitive, hypersensitive, or less, um, it's scored as a one. If it's perceived to be the same as the face, it's scored as a two. And again, an asterisk is used for non-SCI related sensory impairment. Pinprick sensation is slightly more complicated because the patient must be able to correctly identify each end of the pin. If they can't do that on their face, again, there's no point in proceeding with the rest of the examination. When testing the key sensory points, it's important to randomly alternate the sharp and dull ends of the pin at each dermatome at the key sensory point and ask the patient if they perceive the stimulus to be sharp or dull. Obviously, if they don't perceive the stimulus at all, it's scored as a zero. If they can feel the touch, either if it feels sharp or dull, and they can't distinguish the sharp and dull ends of the pin, it's also scored as a zero. So perceiving the sharp end of the pin is sharp and the dull end of the pin is sharp and not telling a difference is a zero. And that's a, an occasional error that people will make. If they can tell the difference between the sharp and dull ends of the pin, being able to consistently recognize the sharp end of the pin as sharp, um, but having it be different than the face, either sharper and more intense than the face or less intense, it's scored as a one. If the, if the sensation, the sharpness is the same as the face, it's scored as a two. And again, if there's a non-spinal cord impairment present, an asterisk is used to note that. As I mentioned previously, there's a detailed downloadable sensory guide that uh, provides clear-cut anatomic uh, reference points and directions to locate each of the key sensory points. Um, this can be printed out, brought into the exam room, or view it on your mobile device um, if necessary to help uh, ensure uh, you're able to uh, perform the exam accurately. One uh, key error that is often um, uh, occurs with uh, the key sensory points is many times people assume the uh, first web space of the foot is the L5 key sensory point, and that's incorrect. It's over the third metatarsal phalangeal joint. In, a, in the InStep web course on the Asia website, there's a number of videos as well that are presented that go over the sensory exam in detail. And if you're looking for more information, I encourage you to uh, go through the InStep course. There are 10 key muscle functions, five in the upper extremity, five in the lower extremity. Uh, they are elbow flexion, wrist extension, elbow extension, middle finger distal phalanx flexion, fifth finger abduction, hip flexion, knee extension, 
ankle dorsiflexion, long toe extension, and ankle plantar flexion. It's important to note that all these can be performed in the supine position, uh, with the caveat being that uh, lumbosacral uh, fractures and instability may um, be a contraindication to performing hip flexion because of the rotation of the pelvis on the lower lumbar fracture. Muscle strength rating is a zero to five point scale, um, which is the MRC scale. Zero total paralysis, one palpable or visible contraction with minimal motion. A two is full range of motion with gravity eliminated. Three is active motion against gravity. Four is active motion against gravity with the ability to take some resistance and five is normal. And again, if there's a non-spinal cord impairment affecting strength testing, such as let's say a painful joint, which results in giveaway weakness, um, that could be scored as a four star. Um, perhaps if there's a severe peripheral neuropathy with EHL weakness that pre-exists the spinal cord injury, perhaps that's scored as a two star, three star, et cetera. Similar to the sensory exam, there is a detailed motor exam guide that uh, includes directions for patient positioning for all of the uh, muscle grade uh, testing, as well as directions to the patient um, and um, uh, images that show the placement of the examiner's hands and the patient. Um, additionally, in the exam guide, there's key uh, points where uh, problems can occur, such as the C7 examination, where the patient will use external rotation of the shoulder to achieve uh, passive extension at the elbow, and that may uh, trick naive examiners. Um, as is the case for the sensory exam, there are also a number of videos in the in-step course that can help clarify positioning and uh, how to conduct all the key um, muscle um, uh, uh, assessments. As I mentioned previously, uh, non-key muscle strength testing is also uh, critical for distinguishing uh, sensory incomplete IASB injury from motor incomplete AIC injury. Um, and to do that, there needs to be motor function more than three levels below the motor level. Um, to determine that, non-key muscle functions have been defined by root level. So one can determine if a particular non-key muscle function is more than three levels below the motor level. And this is uh, presented on the back of the scoring sheet. The final element of the examination, which contributes to the classification and determination of spinal cord severity is the anal rectal examination. Just as the motor and sensory examination changes over time, the anal rectal examination changes as well and will need to be periodically repeated. This examination is easiest in the side, for the patient in the sideline position, but it can be performed if the patient is supine. Um, additionally, in addition, you know, beyond classifying the injury severity and completeness, it also provides some useful information in a bowel program uh, prescription. Typically, the sensory examination is performed first. Um, this is to assess both light touch and pinprick sensation just outside the mucocutaneous junction. Um, at the same time, while pinprick sensation is being assessed, the presence or absence of an anal wink can be determined as well. Once the sensory examination is complete, the uh, internal anal canal examination can be performed. This only requires the distal phalanx to be inserted into the anal canal. At that point, assessment of resting anal tone can be performed and the patient can be asked to squeeze the anal sphincter as if they're trying to prevent passing a bowel movement or passing gas may be possible to see the anal contraction. If not, the examiner may feel it around uh, the distal phalanx. At that point, light or deep pressure can also be assessed um, in the anal canal. A few details of the anal rectal examination. It's important to avoid inserting the finger too far into the anal canal. If the entire digit is inserted such that stimulation of the prostate or pelvic organs may occur, that sensation may be perceived by the patient and could be confused as having 
deep anal uh, pressure uh, preservation. Um, to assess anal pressure preservation, directional pressure, right, left, anterior, posterior can be used. Patient may be able to perceive that. Or the tissues of the anal uh, canal can be squeezed between the finger in the anal canal and the thumb, and that pressure may be uh, perceptible. It's important not to ask the patient to bear down as the, this will elicit a Valsalva maneuver, and that may cause the pelvic floor to descend or move, and that may be misperceived as volitional anal contraction. All of these elements of the examination are used to plan rehabilitation and assign or determine the prognosis for significant recovery. As is shown here in this longstanding uh, figure from uh, the Clinical Practice Guidelines Spinal Cord uh, Consortium, um, all of the incomplete injuries have a su substantially better prognosis for significant recovery as compared to an AISA or complete injury. And we'll be talking more about classification in the talks that follow mine. The final element of the 2019 revisions to the standards involves changing uh, definition and application of the zone of partial preservation. We know a large zone of partial preservation is also a favorable prognostic sign for recovery. And the 2019 revisions clarified when to document that. In particular, the motor zone of partial preservation is documented when voluntary anal contraction is absent, and it's the lowest motor function on each side of the body. The sensory zone of partial preservation is documented if deep anal canal pressure is absent and if S4-5 sensation is absent on that side of the body. And again, these are new revisions to the standards just um, put forth in 2019. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, over the last uh, 20 to 30 minutes, I've highlighted uh, that 80 years ago, we began a journey with spinal cord injury center development pioneers such as Donald Monroe and Sir Ludwig Gutmann. 40 years ago, the spinal cord examination was defined and it's been subsequently revisit, revised many times over um, that interval. 30 years ago, we began to understand that spinal cord injury teaching was paramount and despite the availability of pocket booklets, videotapes, uh, DVDs, and the in-step uh, uh, online web course, in-person teaching such as we're doing today remains a fundamental element of uh, learning and conducting the exam reliably and consistently. So I thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts today and look forward to the um, subsequent speakers talks and the uh, discussion that follows. Again, thank you. Thank you very much, Ron. Naveen. Thank you, Joy. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Rahid Osman. He has been a consultant in spinal cord injury for 18 years, based at Oswestry. He is also the clinical lead clinician for the National uh, Spinal Cord Injury Network. Um, he is a member of the CRG for Spinal Services and honorary senior lecturer at Kiel University. Thank you, Mr. Osman. Now we look forward to your talk on interpretation of INSKI examination. Morning, Uniski interpretation. Uh, for interpretation of the result of the clinical examination of neurological Uniski, we need Good to look at the level, which that means sensory level, motor level, which gives us the level of injury. Also, the lesion is important to get complete or incomplete lesion and Asia impairment score uh, and also zone of partial preservation. This was the top things I'm going to cover in this short talk. The first one, it is, uh, well, this is uh, the chart of the Iniski. 
which you can see is the lower part of the chart. That's what the information we need to summarize our examination. And in the back of the chart also, there is some uh, guidelines about how to reach the steps and uh, summarize and classify or interpret the, the results of the examination. The first thing that uh, we need to look at is the sensory level. The sensory level of the injury is the most caudal intact dermatome for both pin break and light touch sensation. And you have to be done for the right and left side separately. In this diagram, you can see the green uh, color uh, in the body showing that the normal sensation level. Uh, this is an example of the uh, sensory level uh, interpretation, which you can see in this uh, example that both sides are T6 for both left and right side for both bin brick and, and light touch sensation. You can see that is a T6 sensory level. Then after we decided which sensory level in both sides, we, go, we move then across to the motor level. The motor level, it is the lowest key muscle function that has grade of three or more on testing. Uh, there is uh, uh, there is no re uh, in the regions that where there is no myotome to test, the motor level is presumed to be the same as sensory level. In this diagram, you can see the green color shows that the last normal or grade three above muscle power in that diagram, and that yeah, makes that the motor level. This example, you can see C7 in the right side, in the sensory, in the left is a T7, and that shows that the right side and left side are for sensory and, and motor level uh, classification or interpretation of that. So after we decided about the sensory level and the motor level, then now we need to look at the neurological level of injury. Which is that important? Because that shows us the intact sensation and also the anti-gravity grade three or more muscle function strength. And that provided there is normal intact sensory and motor function rostery. And the no, uh, neurological level of injury is the most cephalide uh, of the sensory and motor levels. I just show an example here. This is, uh, as I said, that is sensory C7 uh, in the right side. So that neurological level and motor level is a C7 and T7 in both right and left, but the most caudal. Uh, Neurological level is a C7. So this neurological level is C7 in this case. After we decided the, the neurological level, we will move on to decide the lesion. The, by that I mean, is the lesion complete or incomplete? And then according to that, we make the Asia impairment scale grades. The complete, when we say complete, that means there is no sacral sparing. In the second experience, of course, it is presence of the sensory and motor function in the S4 and S5. And also, there is a voluntary anal contracture and, and also deep anal pressure sensation. As we call it, it is a known sign. An example of that in this case, there is a no sensory level or uh, for any sensation in the sacral area, S4, S5, and also there is no uh, voluntary anal contraction and no deep anal pressure sensation. So again, it's a known sign, and that means that it's complete lesion, and that what is what is definition of the complete lesion. And this is another example of complete lesion again, and around that area. And that is a Asia impairment scale. So if we move on to the Asia impairment scale B, which is summarized as sensory incomplete. 
So this, but it's motor complete. So in this case, there is a um, neurological le uh, level of injury is C7. And also when you look down there in the sacral area, there is some reservation of sensation around the area of S4, S5. And there is no motor power below the level of the injury. And that making it uh, um, Asia impairment scale B. Moving on to the C motor incomplete, when there is uh, also sensory reservation, but also there is motor function is reserved as a most caudal sacral segment. And that means that this include key or non-key muscle functions are less than half of them are grade three or above. This example, you see that there's some sacral preservation of sensation in the sacral area. This is a level here is a C7, or neurological level is C7. And also that means that Asia impairment scale is a C because there is some preservation of motor power below the level of the injury. Again, C7, and there's some reservation of motor power below the level of the injury, and that making a classification Asia uh, C, Asia environment scale C. Moving on to uh, uh, Asia environment scale D, there is motor incomplete status with at least half or more than half of the key muscle functions below the neurological level of injury having a grade three or above. And this is an example that is a, the sensory preservation in the sacral area. And also that is a impairment a neurological level is a C6, which is being clear here according to the sensory level. And for the motor power, you can see more than half of the key muscles are grade three or above. And that make it is grade D. Moving on to the normal or E uh, Asia impairment scale. And this only if there was a de demonstrated neurological deficit before this examination, it has improved to normal. This is an example of it, and you can see that all the dermatome for sensation, uh, for pinprick, and also for light touch, and for motor power, all of them are, are normal, that including, of course, S4 and S5. So that's uh, that what I mentioned, it is uh, Asia impairment scale, which of course is from A to E. Now we move to the zone of partial preservation, which is used sometimes and also only used when there is Asia impairment scale of A. So that zone of partial preservation means as the lowest dermatome or myotome on each side with some preservation. That can be sensory and motor and should be in right or left. And as I said, is recorded only for complete lesions. So regarding the interpretation of the, uh, of, of the INISC is important as a clinical decision making. And of course that will, uh, will, uh, will guide us for what treatments the patient will receive. And if there is any follow up in the future shows that is it improved or not improved by documenting this. So this is an example of uh, Partial reservation, you can see this lesion is complete. And it is a uh, Asia environment scale is A. And the C7 is the level of the neurological level. And uh, you can see there is some preservation of sensation below the level of the injury. And in right and left, and you can see that in the end there, uh, result of uh, zone of partial preservation in the right and the left, you have to put it in sensory or motor level according to the examination. Thank you. How many minutes left?
Thank you, Ahid. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Srinivasa Buditi, who is a consultant colleague of mine here in Oswestry, and he's also an uh, honorary lecturer at the Cardiff University. Mr. Buditi's presentation, play, please. Good morning. International standards for neurological classification of spinal cord injury, classification and pitfalls. The recommended order of uh, steps in classification for international standards is uh, mentioned in the second page of in skin neurological examination chart. In summary, we need to determine the sensory level, motor level, neurological level, and check if the injury is complete or incomplete, and then determine the Asia impairment scale. This particular flow chart will help us determine the Asia impairment scale based on three questions. The first question is, about the function in S4-5 distribution. If there is sacral, uh, if there's no sacral sparing, in other words, if there's no function in S4-5 distribution, then the injury is considered complete and it will be Asia impairment scale A, and then we'll record the zone of partial preservation. If the injury is not complete, but if it is motor complete, in other words, if there is absent voluntary anal contraction and there is no motor function three levels below the motor level, then it will be considered as motor complete and it will be Asia impairment scale B. If it is motor incomplete, then we need to count the number of key muscles below the neurological level injury with power of at least grade three. And if that number is less than 50% of the total key muscles below the neurological level of injury, then it will be Asia impairment scale C. And if that number is more than 50%, it will be Asia impairment scale D. That's how we classify or determine the Asia impairment scales A to D. The fifth one, which is Asia impairment scale E, is only used for follow-up examinations where the sensory and motor function has completely recovered from a previous well-documented neurological deficit following spinal cord injury. If the patient has been neurologically intact from the beginning of the spinal cord injury, this classification does not apply. There are pitfalls in the examination, classification, and interpretation of um, the neurological uh, data that we um, get in the international standards examination. To start with, the in-scale neurological examination is not complete examination of spinal cord injury. Um, for example, the deep tendon reflexes, joint position sense, and vibration sense are not um, a part of the um, in-scale neurological examination. In addition, there are also various uh, examination difficulties. There's a lot of variation in practice in sensory examination. Uh, for example, the recommended method is to check the light touch sensation with cotton wisp and pinprick sensation with a safety pin. However, uh, there is a lot of uh, different methods get used for the examination in clinical practice. And also there is variation in the examination of dermatomes as well. For sensory exa examination, for example, a C5 dermatome, uh, there is a method of uh, checking the sensations or the lateral aspect of the shoulder. However, according to Inski examination, it will be over the lateral aspect of the elbow uh, or the anti-cubital fossa uh, just above the elbow flexor crease. Similarly, for the S1 examination, it's the lateral aspect of the heel. Sensory examination in certain areas can pose challenges, um, especially T2 and T3 level examination because of the overlap of the sensory or the uh, innervation of the suprascapular nerves. 
uh, there are anecdotal reports of uh, um, wrong classification due to uh, this difficulty of uh, properly examining uh, T2 and T3 uh, dermatomes. I would like to um, mention about a couple of uh, um, things about pinprick uh, examination as well, pinprick sensation examination. If there is hypersensitivity in any particular dermatome, this should be considered as grade one because it is an altered sensation compared to a reference normal skin sensation, um, for example, checked on the face. And also in situations where patient can feel something but not, cannot differentiate between sharp and dull sensation at the time of pinprick sensation examination, this should be recorded as um, grade zero or absent pinprick sensation. Coming to the motor testing, uh, some patients can have trick movements or show trick movements which can uh, make the motor examination difficult. For example, using the gravity for elbow extension um, testing and uh, also wrist extension used for finger flexion because of the tenodesis effect. This should be borne in mind when we are doing motor testing. There are also some variation in the examination of uh, uh, particular muscles for examining um, specific uh, myotomes. Uh, for example, C5 can be tested with shoulder abduction, but according to Inski examination, it should be the elbow flexors. Contractures, fractures, and severe pain can interfere with motor testing. And when this is the case, either this should be recorded as not testable if uh, these conditions are severe, or the motor grading should be uh, followed by a, a star sign to indicate that there has been difficulty in the motor examination. Uh, whatever it is, it, sh it can be recorded in the comments box on the neurological examination chart. Grade four, five muscle power should be based on a testing, should be based on the individual patient's uh, muscle power, and it's better not to use uh, plus and minus after the motor grading. Classification pitfalls. It is very clear that uh, neurological level is the last nor normal segment and not the first abnormal segment when we are going from the rostral to caudal direction. It may be just one level in most of the cases, that discrepancy. However, it can be, it can have a lot of uh, significant implications. It's also possible to define um, Asia impairment scale even when there are some non-tested areas in the neurological examination chart. I'll show you an example. In this particular case, the sensory function in S3, S4, 5 dermatomes has not been checked and is recorded as not testable. However, the rest of the clinical examination has got necessary or adequate uh, information to record this as an incomplete injury with Asia impairment scale D. Interpretation, interpretation pitfalls can happen uh, when there are associated injuries or conditions like hemiplegia, secondary to stroke, uh, head injury, spinal cord injury at multiple levels, and also brachial plexus or peripheral nerve injury, which can interfere with the um, classification and the interpretation of uh, INSKI examination. And also there are situations where different clinical picture with the same level and lesion. I'll show you an example. This uh, uh, first case where the sensory motor and neurological level is C12 with a complete lesion Asia impairment scale A. If you look at the muscle power in the lower limb key myotomes, it's all zeros. In the second example, with the same sensory motor and neurological level, with uh, complete Asia A um, clinical, uh, sorry, um, picture. Uh, if you look at the um, key myotomes in the lower limbs, the muscle power is anywhere from three to five. So with the same level and lesion of T12 Asia A, there is no movement in the lower limbs in case example one, whereas grade three to five muscle power with a lower extremity motor score of 41 in second case. So the inference is that it's not just enough 
to just mention level and lesion in some situations. More information has to be provided and distinction can be made between these two case scenarios by uh, inform uh, by providing information about sensory or motor scores and zone of partial preservation. You can see that uh, INSKI um, is quite complex and uh, there is a learning curve. This is one of the studies that we uh, did in our um, hospital uh, where um, the knowledge of INSKI was tested among the uh, resident doctors who are um, examining um, spinal cord injury patients in accident and emergency departments. They found that uh, um, there is difficulty in identification of motor levels and uh, identification of Asia impairment scale. Published literature also showed that INSKI training significantly improves the classification skills regardless of the experience in spinal cord injury medicine specialty. So how do we avoid the pitfalls? Uh, it can be done by standardization of examination technique and training. Uh, one of the good training resources is uh, the uh, American Spinal Injuries Association Learning Center, where it, there is excellent um, online course uh, for learning uh, neurological examination according to uh, international standards. There are also algorithm calculators, uh, the websites of which I have uh, um, put at the top of the slide. Uh, these algorithm calculators help in interpretation and uh, classification of the data that was entered in. All the neurological examination data, sensory, motor, voluntary renal contraction, and DAP, that can be entered into the calculator and automatically calculates the, all the parameters related to spinal cord injury classification, including level, lesion, um, and zone of partial preservation if uh, needed, if, if appropriate. This is the second calculator, an example of uh, the European um, uh, spinal cord injury group. So in summary, in skin neurological examination has a learning curve. There's a lot of variation in practice and we have gone through some of the pitfalls associated with this. What is important is uh, knowledge and training and uh, there are uh, learning resources and tools to uh, minimize the difficulties associated with uh, uh, interpretation and classification of spinal cord injury. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buditi Naveen. Our uh, next speaker is Dr. Alison Graham, consultant physician in spinal cord injury at National Spinal Cord Injury Center, Stoke Mandeville. She's also a clinical lead for adults and peds. I thank you, Dr. Alison Graham. We Hello, my name is Dr. Alison Graham. I'm a consultant physician at the National Spinal Injury Center at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. Thank you for asking me to be here. And I'm here to talk about the international standard new classification. For experienced clinicians and therefore it's even more difficult to do it in children partly because there isn't as many experienced clinicians and luckily not as many children who require the assessment to be performed. It takes time, trust and patience to work with a young person to get a good uh, assessment performed. A single clinician cannot perform this unaided and preparation for the test is vital both for you as the clinical team and for the child and the family. And essentially what I'm going to do is talk through the five W's and the H, the who, the what, the where, the why and the when, and how we perform it. So why do we assess? Essentially we're looking to establish the level and severity of the injury. This allows us to get the correct diagnosis and plan the correct immediate treatment 
but also to rule out other levels of injury. And it's really about using the combination of the clinical correlation with the imaging and with the history to make sure that they all fit and it makes sense of the, the presentation of the child in front of you. We need to review and check that there's been no deterioration, that anything wrong has happened once the injury has immediately been sustained. But we're also looking to see over the future, has there been improvement either from natural neuroplasticity or from any intervention that may have been planned and worked on with the child. We are looking to see if we can predict recovery using the prognostics that's afforded by this examination finding. And as I said, plan the rehabilitation and the treatment. It's also a medical legal necessity. Some form of documentation is required. And in order to advance practice, we need to look at the uniformity and check that what one unit is doing is uh, not very different from others. If one person's getting uh, improvement, is it? Is it a real improvement or is it a problem with recording? This is the INSCI, which is even worse than the ASIA. The ASIA was the American Spinal Injuries Association and they decided to change the recording uh, of how we do it by taking away from ASIA because people felt it was only belonging to this particular organisation and obviously it didn't. It was a worldwide classification. It's a horrible chart. It is, however, now available online and that seems to improve how people actually do complete it. The adult chart and the paediatric chart are easily available uh, to, to download and they are identical. There is no difference for a young person, a child or an adult. It's all the one form. So what do we need? We need a standardised procedure. There's been a move away from doing incredibly complicated neurological assessment with every single uh, aspect of what you can check in NERVS to actually looking at what do we really need to have so that we can sort of talk to each other clinically. If you go on to the Asia website, you will find there's a whole variety of learning resources there. In order to do the paediatric assessment, it's always best to get to know how to perform the adult assessment. And that's the INSCI. And that's available. It, you have to pay, and but that does allow you to then get on to using all the different aspects. We tend to use the Wii Step because that's the paediatric standard e-training programme. But you'll also find on that particular site the autonomic, etc. Ways of standardising recording. Where you perform it is actually quite important if you've got the choice. Obviously, if you're in A and E, it's incredibly difficult. But if you're actually looking at recording what's happening with the child on an ongoing basis, you've got to remember that you've not got to put the child off early. And so, the correct environment is really important for a lot of paediatric aspects. We tend not to use the bed space because we tend to protect the bed space as a safe haven, that nothing is done to the child that uh, you know could upset them. So it does tend to be in a treatment room. We want it to be safe, comfortable, the right environmental temperature, etc. We want it to be child friendly, but not to be so distracting that they can't follow the simple instructions. But we do have some, some uh, methods of distraction and keeping the child on board. And nowadays that tends to be the iPad or phone. The timing of when is obviously as early as possible on the post onset of injury or paralysis. And then the follow up very much depends on either sort of the local clinical guidelines or the, any clinical change or deterioration in the child. A lot of it will be impacted by uh, when the family feels that something is different and other other therapists may feel that something isn't quite right. So it's very difficult to say this is the time that it must be done. It's really got to be clinically focused. We tend to review our children on a yearly basis when we review them for an annual assessment. Uh, if there's nothing going different, otherwise uh, it would be on the clinical concern. And one of the things that we found is that depending on the age of the child and what else is going on, 
they tend to look at very small chunks of examination as both the child and the clinician tire. You're not going to get all this done in the one go. So who? You obviously need the child. You need a family member if the age is appropriate. A lot of the younger people uh, don't want an adult in. They'd much rather maybe have the child in, have the family member in for the sensory and motor examination. But if it's coming up from the rectal examination, they'd much rather have a nurse rather than a family member. The clinician needs some clinical support. It's very, very difficult to get the child in the best frame of mind, get them positioned well, do the examination, record it, etc. And so it is very much a two-person approach. We also will use a variety of different toys. While we have the, the distraction from the other uh, gadgets, we use the toy in order to show what we're going to be doing. This is great for younger children. It doesn't go down too well with the adolescents. So how? In very young children, there is no way that you're going to perform this test. So it's not going to be a formal assessment. It's going to be clinical observation by yourself, by different team members, by the families through play. We've even had families bring in mobile phone footage to say, look, I can see them doing this particular uh, procedure. And it is about building up this kind of montage of what you see with the child. It's observational motor assessment is through play and therapy, and it's very much done at the child's pace. You're not going to get them to move the leg if they don't want to. If they're much happier moving their arms and go with the arm examination. For the sensory testing, again, it's very much about play and it's about tickling, it's about what they can feel. It's not going to be a formal neurotip or uh, swab to test things. It's going to be what the toy does, etc. And it's about building up that rapport that you're going to get closer to be able to observe the child that's not screaming and crying because you've got nothing from that. As I say, we use the INSCI form even though in the younger children, it looks like a complete dog's dinner because we've missed out lots of things, but we just have to document that that was not possible to, uh, to test. For primary school children through to adolescents, the testing can actually be done well, as long as it's done at their pace and that you don't push it just to complete the test. For adolescents, you will normally, if they're in the right mood, be able to complete it in a very similar way to adult practice. So the wee step, currently it's about $50 a year to allow you to access this, and that's what we're going to use. Although it says it's free, you've actually got to pay the initial cost to get to that. It still needs translating from the English into American. There's lots of things that you just think, I'm not going to be able to do that. You're going to have to translate how you talk to the child. But it is actually an excellent resource, and it's really good for going back and forward to try and get you know, improve your skills once you've done the examination one child, you think that didn't go so well, go back to the B step before you do the next examination. So age is really important. The use of INSCI, as I said, for an accurate evaluation of injury and severity is really not recommended from the age of birth to six years. This first came out from the workfront in America and we thought, oh, our kids would be far better. We tried it and we were actually just the same, if not worse. So it is something which has been sort of uh, validated, but incredibly difficult for under six. From age of six onwards, you can actually get good motor and sensory scores with moderate to strong reliability between different uh, examiners. However, the third part of the test is this anal rectal examination. And it's very, very difficult to perform in children to actually get them to work out what deep pressure is, particularly rather than just the sort of uh, anal touch or sensation. And in children who've been injured before they've uh, actually achieved toilet training, it's almost impossible. And even in older children above the age of six, if they were never toilet trained, then actually getting them to participate in the in rectal examination is incredibly difficult. So in the age under six, we do use the form, but we accept incomplete forms. 
We use clinical judgment of what we're going to try and assess and what we need to concentrate on. We do document everything that we can and we write all over the form, which is why in some ways the written form is slightly better than the, the online one, which doesn't give you as much option to change. And we record the age of the child in both years and months, not just as a big group of the overall year. What we're looking at is, along with everybody else who's involved, paediatric spinal cord injury, is can we get a clinical correlation uh, with what we're seeing, what we're able to examine with the history. People have been looking at other ways of uh, how do we do this using uh, diffuser tensor imaging, but it's not widely available, but that probably seems to be one of the best ways of getting a good level. The MRI levels do correlate within one second of the clinical uh, impact. But again, great for a once-off, but it's not something that you can just easily keep changing and checking. So one of the things about the wee step is a lot of the children that we see, the spinal cord injury is not the only impairment that they have. And therefore, it's, while it's difficult with a young child with normal cognitive uh, growth, it's incredibly difficult when a child has learning difficulties, combined head injury, and again, as I said, injured before toilet training. And it's also not an easy test to do in very acute settings or intensive care. Where neurological examination is going to be almost impossible. And you're much more reliant on the imaging that you've got. Other things about patient preparation and position, you've really got to pick up a good time of the day and don't wake up a sleeping child. You're not going to get anywhere with a fraught, distressed child. There are sort of information leaflets that are available. We tend to give them uh, to the family and the child if uh, they're old enough to take part. And it's about written information and discussion about the test in advance. Essentially, we're trying to get the family on board and lay their fears. And it is one of the things I talk about is it's, it's an emotional reaction. It's, it is something that this family has got to take on in addition to all the other aspects of impact of spinal cord injury. The families are really terrified that you're going to give them more bad news. The child is more concerned of will it hurt. So often the, the actual proper positioning is supine, but for the anorectal examination, as long as you've not got unstable spine, you can move the child onto the side for that. So for the sensory aspect of it, the key dermatomes are the ones that we're looking at, and that's well explained in the wee step of where we're going to sort of test for. Important to remember that if this child has been injured for a long time and they've got um, scoliosis, then the dermatomes are not going to be lying symmetrically. And it's important just to remember that when you're documenting. Again, we start with the, the easiest for the child to sort of comprehend and take part with. And so that tends to be light touch first. Got to be non-threatening. We do it as part of play for the younger child. It's a tickle. We usually start with the face as a normal reference because these children will normally have a um, completely normal sensation on their face. We will demonstrate it on the family or on the toy. And you just hope that they sort of take part, or the family in particular, don't get uh, upset about it. The whole thing about the pinprick testing, that's where a huge amount of anxiety comes. I disagree with the wee step about using a safety pin, we use the neuro tip. We let the child practice on a toy. The other thing is people say, oh, you ask the child to practice on you as the clinician. I'm not doing that anymore. So just give it to the child and their toy. Again, it's about knowing what the appropriate language is uh, with this family when you're sort of looking at touch. We're not looking at it being sharp and dull as we would in the adult. We would use pointy or jaggy, depending on where you come from, and get it in the language that they understand. And for the kids, we work in the opposite direction. We work from the foot um, and from the peripheries into the centre. And that appears to cause less anxiety. It's often working from the area of no sensation to sensation. 
you have to work within the child's attention span. Uh, they will get bored or fed up. And it's also they get really upset if you're asking them to continually do something that they cannot do. And the family often will get very upset about this as well. You know, so you really do need to pick up on the sort of social cues to move on. This is a test that a child is going to have to have done to them, you know, at least every year. And what we're trying not to do is to make it too upsetting that the kid does not want to take part in it. For sensory testing, you should be asking the kids to keep their eyes closed. Uh, I don't really think it's great to kind of clap an adult's hand over their eyes. It tends to upset them more. So again, we use this iPad. It's a wonderful technique. If they're concentrating on the iPad, as long as it's not something too overstimulating, they can still distract their eyes with that while you're asking them in between times, can they feel it? And again, just about the scoliosis, you've got the shift in dermatome height. So you've got to work out your dermatomes from your key landmarks. You can draw on the child sometimes if they'll let you to see where things are. The, they are more asymmetrical as you come away from the apex and the, of the curvature and the, they're more equal when you're at the apex. Going on to motor examination and some tricks of the trade. The age is to remember that it's it's age appropriate resistance when you're asking the child to move a, a muscle and against you. Don't make it into a wrestling match. It's not about sort of who's the strongest. It's about making sure that you've got either some movement there you, um, and you've got symmetry or asymmetry. And just remember that it, particularly some of the younger kids will kind of tire themselves out and it's not what you're trying to do as part of the test. You have to ask the child what they can do and often explain what exactly what it is you're asking them to do. And you're asking them to do something even if they can't do it. And that's very difficult because you're almost hammering home what they've lost. You've got to be aware that children will quite naturally find trick movements. Children are far quicker to compensate for what they can't do by using movements that they just immediately sort of pick up and use. And when you're examining just to make sure that you are maybe preventing the elbow contributing to the wrist movements, etc., uh, in order to test exactly what it is you're wanting to, to do. The other thing to remember is that muscles don't all develop the same. They're not all little muscles waiting to get bigger. Uh, particularly within the hand, the T1 intrinsics, we may not develop until the age of four or five. So you can test all day long in the younger child, but they're just not going to be there. And the other thing is to demonstrate what movement, which is relatively age appropriate. Uh, revving up of sort of bike handles seems to be fairly common, no matter what the age, but the tiny little ones, making star hands in order to see what the intrinsics will do. Again, it's about translating the neurological perfection into day-to-day -day speak. So the interrect examination is the last test as part of the comprehensive uh, examination here. It's not really appropriate for those under six. And again, when you really, um, even the older six, you have to think, do, what am I really going to get from this? Do I absolutely need to do it rather than just going through the process? We need to make sure the child is positioned correctly, that usually would be supine or maybe to turn the child over into lateral position as long again as it's safe to do. It is a case of going over the instructions clearly and knowing what the child and their family call the anus, because most families have got their own um, words that they will use for this and also for um, just general rectal examinations and stuff. Who you have in the room for sensory motor testing may not be the same people that you want in the room. But you do need, uh, obviously, somebody to help you. If you some, often see examiners are so closely intense on making sure that they're getting the examination right, they're failing to pick up on the uh, facial expressions. And so maintaining di dignity and privacy and asking the child themselves who they want to be present. If they're being injured above the age of toilet training, then you're basically you're asking them to squeeze during the test and just as if they're going to stop 
solid or gas or, and using their particular words. If they're injured before toilet training, then you essentially have to show them what you want to do. And it is about using a finger and your fist and to show them that these are the muscles and what you're trying to sort of find out. We have got examination dolls that we can use. They're fine for younger children, the older a child and the adult just think you're being stupid when you show them that. If the child is stabilised, make sure that you're not going to move the child by doing the examination and so gently stabilise the pelvis. And the other thing to be aware of is that children will also try to help you by controlling their abdominal muscles and sort of changing their breathing. And it's not really what you're wanting to do, it's the deep pressure you're trying to find out. The other thing is that a lot of spinal cord injured children, the minute that you actually do the examination, you elicit other um, autonomic changes and sometimes the child will you know, react as if they felt something, but it's not actually the deep pressure, it's this um, other uh, reflexes. And to use the appropriate size finger, not necessarily the index finger. So checking for sacral spinning with the light touch and the pinprick usually isn't as bad as the actual deep pressure because the child is often familiar with the insertion of suppositories and sometimes what we've done for some of the light touch and the pinprick is we've actually done that particular testing at the time that they're having suppositories inserted and that seems to work quite well. In a younger child with a stable spine they may not feel very comfortable being examined lying on the bed and one of the things which can be done is that the child can be held upright against the parent's chest. The child tends to look over the shoulder and you have an observer behind that child and you perform the, the rectal examination when they're supported against the parent's chest. This uh, allows the child to be held and comforted while the test is being done. One of the things is just to make sure that you check you know, that you've written and documented that this was the alternative method for doing it and uh, you use the combination of the, the facial expressions and behaviour and you're really just looking for is sensation and is it there or not there rather than any details. So these are roughly the kind of ages of when it's worthwhile doing and when it is not. And um, I think it's important just to remember not to sort of turn this into a uh, can't do it, it's wrong. Just document what you can do, write it down and review. And then for us in particular, we tend to review that obviously on an annual assessment. Again, just one of the things about muscle strength is just remembering that we're looking at, again, standardised assessment using the key muscles. Again, we're looking for recovery and deterioration and how we're going to, to, to check to see if anything we've done makes things better and that muscle strength is appropriate to the age of the child. Lots of examinations, lots of involvement with the child with spinal cord injury, not even just in the early days, but as life goes on for this family and their child with spinal cord injury is difficult, it's scary. And the families will respond that every time you come, they're still, you know, they see a doctor and they think, what's wrong? And the examination becomes a big thing because they're very, very scared that you're there to give them further bad news. And so every word that you're saying on the examination of their child, even though they observe this child on a day-to-day -day basis, is worrying for them. So it is a frightening experience. There's also you've been incredibly careful that complete injury that you mentioned does not mean a severed cord, but that's often what sort of um, what the family's opinion is, and you've been very careful of the words that you use. And the other thing that children's results getting better or worse isn't necessarily what's really going on in the cord. It's just that the child, either on that particular day, isn't responding well to you, or it's just that they do understand more and they take on board more this year than they did last year. So in summary, this is a difficult assessment. You need to review when it needs to be done, who's going to be doing it, and approach it as a team approach, and approach it as something that you're going to do in a variety of different segments.
document everything. Do not be concerned that you haven't got everything in the one um, take, but just make sure you've written it down. Ideally, in the future, we will have a child friendly version, or it may well be that we move away from the actual hands on testing and it does become much more centred around imaging. Thank you very much for your time. The first question relating to um, neurological assessment is from Professor Waghi El Mazri, is stating, shouldn't it be more accurate for Asia examination to be called International um, Neurological System of uh, Neurological Examination documentation as it is? So I, I agree entirely. I think it is. Uh, uh, it was just to mention, though, for those who do not know. The, the terminology of international standards is applicable and Asia and this course is, is no longer used. Good morning to you, Ron. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you for the chance to participate. Thank you. So we have a question. What's your protocol for mobilization for patients with central cord uh, syndrome? This is a question from Amkad Medani. Uh, Ron, are you able to answer this? You know, I, certainly for for our protocol, I mean, we will uh, mobilize people virtually immediately. Um, the almost everyone with a central cord injury will um, have surgery very early on, within twelve to twenty four hours. And, um, and and we'll mobilize them as soon as possible, the day of surgery or the following morning, based on their pain and level of alertness. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, yeah, that's yeah. great. Joy, would you like to share the UK experience? So, so there is, I have to admit, uh, a variation in practice among centers. So I can speak of my center. Uh, we would offer the patient four to six weeks of um, what we call um, uh, partly called bed rest, but uh, it's actually rehab in recumbent. Uh, so the patient is actually laid flat for four to six weeks. But there is, like I said, there is a variation of practice. And nationally, we are trying to get a uniform um, um, process of agreement of how to actually manage these patients. Thank you, Joy. Um, uh, the, Henry. There is a very important question from Pradeep Tambikat. I'm just, uh, <laughs> how do you feel Insky correlates to functional prognosis as compared to the Frankel classification? Ron, would you like to take that? Yeah, I actually started to type a reply into the chat. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I'm actually not aware of a recent comparison between the um, INSCI and the Franco classification. But um, I, I would imagine they're relatively similar because the, the framework of the INSCI is... Um, essentially, you know, very, very much um, comparable to the Frankel because there's, you know, been, been many years of revisions to the INSCI and there's a bit more detail than the Frankel classification. My guess is INSCI is probably a little more predictive than the Frankel, but uh, fundamentally, you know, a, a Frankel D is more or less similar to a, a an INSC AISD. I mean, I think the difference will be um, a, a Frankel C, I think, could be fairly wide ranging, um, whereas the, 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 the INSC or AISC is a little more precisely defined. And so I, I would guess those folks who have motor sparing, um, it's probably a little more predictive, um, or at least in terms of discerning who's where exactly the prognosis falls. But but nonetheless, all folks with motor sparing generally have a somewhat favorable prognosis. 
Thank you, Ron. Uh, we have another question from Pradeep Tambikat again. He says, Techni while technically it is right that it's called INSKI, Asia is now a well-recognized acronym that most people know. Would it not make sense to continue using them synonymously? It's, oh, well, Ron, you're probably the person. I, you know, I, I actually prefer using INSKI mostly because I'm an American and I think the INSKI sort of honors our European colleagues and international colleagues um, who are a key part of, of validating and updating the standards. Um, and so I, it feels to me just more inclusive to use that. Um, although I recognize there there's a history of people calling it the Asia exam and um, certainly in um, kind of day-to-day -day conversation that happens here as well. Although, again, I, I tend to try to always use INSKI instead. Thank you, I agree with you on that, Ron. Do the terms complete and incomplete in describing neurology at a specific anatomical level of cord injury? For example, cervical cord injury depend entirely on the presence or absence of anal, sensory, or motor sparing. Ron, are you happy to answer this? Sure, I'm. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm happy to um, hear what everyone else says. But uh, the 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 definition of an AIS A injury, which would be considered a complete injury, would be the absence of uh, motor and sensory function in the uh, anal exam area. So the, the absence of voluntary anal contraction, absence of sensation S45, and the absence of deep anal pressure. So just as uh, was presented, the noon sign is is essentially the definition of a complete injury. Um, and, and there was a exam couple of examples shown of that. Um, the, um, so, so if there's any sacral se sensory sparing, anal canal sensation, any S4-5 sensation, and then any motor sparing more than three levels below the motor level, that would be um, consistent with a motor incomplete injury, or if there's just sacral sensory sparing, a sensory incomplete injury.